Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to the Peterson Institute for International Economics. I'm Adam Posen, the Institute's president, and I am thrilled, genuinely thrilled, to be the host today for our good friend and colleague Richard Baldwin on the Washington launch of his new book, The Globotics Upheaval. All of you, I think, know who Richard is, and I will return to his bio in a moment, but I just want to say that his work on globalization, giving it real meaning, linking it to the changes in technological trends, linking it to the underlying economic trade dynamics, basing it in research, is almost without match. Um, and we are very proud to have counted Richard as a colleague and a friend for many years. We were proud to have him present his last book here and to work with him in his leadership roles at Vox EU and at CEPR. But this book, I have to warn you, this is sort of a trigger warning. I don't mean to make light of it. It's kind of depressing. <laughs> Richard will give it to you with great spirit and uh, verve and illustrations, I know. But be prepared. This is a reality check for all of us on the future of work. And, you know, there are an awful lot of institutions and people, good and less good, who've been more doing work under that heading, uh, the future of work and worrying about AI. And uh, I think Richard goes to head of the class. I do have to say, um, I was accused at the Council on Foreign Relations yesterday of being relentlessly promoting the Institute. Um, I do have to say, we are doing work on this as well. Our colleagues Chad Bown and Carolyn Freund have a very recent working paper, Active Labor Market Policies, Lessons for Other Countries from the United States, which we would like you to pick up and read. I think it performs a nice compliment, a little more wonky, a little less visionary, and therefore a little more hopeful um, than Richard's book. Uh, we also continue to maintain our staff at the forefront of practical economic research, as was announced last week, but I wish to reiterate, Maurice Obsfeld, uh, who just stepped down last year as economic counselor at the International Monetary Fund, is joining the Institute, or rather, as of last Friday, joined the Institute as a non-resident senior fellow. He is, of course, a tenured name chair professor, class of 1958 professor of economics at UC Berkeley, which will be his main base. But Maury will continue with our many colleagues to help us bridge the academic and the real world, the rigorous and the relevant. And again, to circle back, that is why we're delighted to have Richard here today. Um, Richard Baldwin is many things. His core title is he's Professor of International Economics at the Graduate Institute in Geneva and has been since 1991. He was director of the Center for, of Economic Policy Research in London, the European NBER, from 2014 to 2018. He was the senior editor of Economic Policy, a leading journal. But of most importantly, in some ways, except for his own work, he was the founder and editor-in-chief of VoxEU.org since March 2006. As I think everyone in our audience knows, this is the premier place for the distillation of economic research into readable form, with, of course, the exception of the Peterson Institute Policy Brief series. Um, and in fact, thanks to Richard, we have had some cross publications between those two. Um, his academic record is, of course, stellar. He's been a visiting research professor at Oxford, a visiting professor at MIT more than once, um, previously at Columbia Business School. The book is out officially, I think, tomorrow, you said. Uh, we have all the information on the website for you to go click, click, and buy it. I encourage you to do so. I have no financial interest in your doing so. Uh, I have an intellectual and a public spirited interest in your doing so. I think it's an outstanding book. I'm not going to try to steal Richard's thunder any more than that. I will just turn over the microphone and the podium to him and say again how proud and grateful we are to have Richard Baldwin speak at his Washington book launch for us. Thank you. Well, thank you, Adam, for those very kind words about me and my book. And 
Thanks to the Peterson Institute uh, for hosting this launch, which was supposed to be the worldwide launch, but my publishers had other ideas, so it kind of got messed up. But in any case, it's here, and I really appreciate the support that uh, the gathering this uh, great set of people to listen to it, the support you've done on the media. I think it's really a tremendous place to launch a book. So if any of you have a book, keep keep call Adam and see it, it's a good thing to do. And as Adam noticed, Mentioned, uh, I, I've been coming to the Peterson Institute for decades, uh, and it's really great to be back. <clears throat> Let me start by explaining why I wrote this book. And I can already see some of you cringe, you know. It's like, if the author has to explain why he wrote the book, probably the world could do without that book. But I, I feel compelled somehow to explain the journey I did, because this is a very different book for me. Um, it started out as a book about the future of globalization. Uh, I, my 2016 book, which I launched right here in this room on 14th November 2016, seven days out of, after the Trump tremor, um, which, uh, as an aside, was bad for the world in my opinion, but great for people who've written books about globalization. And the last chapter of that book uh, was about the future of globalization. And as I presented it around the world, I had hundreds of conversations with people all across uh, the world, all different types of walks of life. And what I found was that, first of all, huge amounts of insights and anecdotes about the future of globalization, but an enormous interest and anxiety about the future of globalization. So I decided to write up my hundreds of conversations and write a book on the future of globalization. But in doing my background research, three points really struck me that changed the course. First of all, it's all about digital, digital technology, our ability to collect, transmit, process, and store information. And I think without exaggeration, or at least in my own view, I think we're at a point in the world where there's two types of progresses going on in the world. The normal progress that affects the material world and an explosive progress that involves anything with digital technology. That these two processes of advance really can't be compared because they're moving at incredibly different paces. The second is many, many analysts were talking about how digital technology is changing the automation of jobs, robotics. Almost every day you'll find something in your newsfeed about robots, but almost nobody was talking about how digital technology was changing globalization, not just automation. The last was I think analysts were talking about the future of work, using the past as a predictor, which of course is always the place to start. But there's one thing that much of that analysis overlooks, or at least explicitly, that the future of both automation and globalization, when it comes to the explosive advances, is about services, not manufacturing. The last three centuries, globalization and automation has been primarily about goods, mining, manufacturing, agriculture, and the service sector is, is still frequently modeled as non-traded. Moreover, since many service jobs couldn't be automated by the computers we have, it was not subject to automation. This one, both the automation and the globalization is coming to the service sector, and using analogies as what happened in the manufacturing sector is leading to people to misunderstand what's going to go on, or at least that's how I've come to, to view it. So that's how this book came to be a book about globalization, robotics, and the future of work. So let me dive in by quoting, uh, this is from a review that Dick Cooper did last week in Foreign Affairs. This speculative book attempts to describe the future of work and explain how to prepare for it. And I like that very much because it, it is speculative. We are talking about the future. And honestly, if you talk about the future, you're making it up. The second thing is it's really about the future of work, not just globalization. And I do try and talk a little bit about how to prepare for it. And that, that brings me to one of my, most, my, one of my favorite uh, sayings is that the future is unknowable, but also inevitable. Now, since the future is unknowable, it takes us economists into unfamiliar territory. There is no data. The paradigms that are well accepted may not apply. 
But the future is coming no matter whether we study it or not. And I feel personally that I have an obligation to use my skills and experience to help people think about what might happen because somebody else is doing it or they're not doing it at all. So let me just jump right into definitions. Globotics, the word everybody hates. I, I've had about a dozen reviews and every single one of them pointed out what an ugly word that was. Now, I invented that word, which smashes together globalization and robotics, hopefully to keep you in mind that automation and digital that you read about every day, it's about globalization and automation at the same time affecting the same jobs. So what we're facing is a globotics transformation, not just the future of automation, not just the future of globalization. Now, when I talk about globalization, obviously the real globalization, normal globalization is continuing and it won't stop, I don't think. But what I'm gonna focus on is a new type of globalization, which I would like to call telemigration. And when I talk about robotics, I'm not talking about those that you saw in Star Trek or Star Wars or the Jetsons. I'm talking about white collar robots as opposed to steel collar robots. Now, telemigration. <clears throat> Telemigration, which I'd like you to think of as remote intelligence, or RI, is people sitting in one nation working in offices in another. So it's something like international telecommuting, international freelancing, and I'm going to talk a lot more about it. But it's in essence people providing intelligence remotely in our offices. When I talk about white collar robots, there's two types. There's the low end. The most important one is robotic process automation. And if you've never heard of RPA, you really should. It's transforming the world of work extremely fast. Like one of the big companies is Blue Prism who went, went uh, public. It's growing at rates of 20, 30%, and it's replacing all sorts of office jobs. Now that's what the robot looks like. That's a picture of the robot. It's software. It's essentially doing a macro. So think about it like this, if I call up if I send an email to Swisscom to switch my subscription so that I can have the US during my 10 day trip here, somebody at Swisscom opens up that email, reads it, decides what I want, then opens up a database, enters a change in my subscription, closes that database, opens up the financial database, changes my charging, closes it, and then moves on. That's done by a human. This does that. It's like a player piano. The the AI opens up the email, reads the email, decides what's in there, opens up the database, changes it. So it does exactly what the human does with the same software in the same way, but faster and with fewer errors and everything's recorded so you know what's going on afterwards. That's replacing a lot of office jobs. This is another one, white collar robots, high end robots. This is Amelia. She plays a big role in my book at the beginning, the middle, the end. The whole story is just an amazing thing. Uh, and, and you can see she's, she's very presentational as well. She actually has an avatar. But a lot of these, like IBM Watson, doesn't have an avatar behind them. These would, if these were restaurants, these would have one Michelin star compared to the RPA. RPA is like McDonald's. Anybody can do it. Uh, and it can be done at the department level for a single process. These, you need AI geniuses to make them work. So they can do all the basic things like reading and writing and talking. But on top of it, they have sophisticated AI databases, which allow them, for example, to answer IT questions or diagnose diseases or look for financial fraud or look for, for deviations in contracts that you've signed. So those, are, those white collar robots are more of a substitute for higher level professional jobs than the RPA stuff. So by this time, there's surely a number of you in the audience going like, yeah, 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 same old wine, new bottle with some fancy words. And, and I, you know, I, I, I can understand that. Um, but I want to spend the next few slides con convincing you why I, or at least explaining why I believe this time is different. First thing, Digitech is advancing like ICT. And, and you've probably noticed that, you know, that people used to talk about ICT and now they talk about digital technology and you go like, what's the difference? Actually, there is no difference. It's the same thing, driven by Moore's law and all that sort of stuff. But the big difference is that ICT was applied to manufacturing, which is industry. In other words, it's physical. So the laws of physics that constrain globalization and ICT 
was, let's say, 80% physical stuff. You had to build factories and ports and, and make things, and a little bit of information and a little bit of communication. The future globalization is applied to services, which is mostly information and mostly communication with only a very little bit of physical. And as a consequence, a different type of physics applies. In particular, the physics that constrained globalization in the past is not constraining it in the same way. The laws of physics of matter meant that no matter how important it was, no matter how profitable it was, it would take you a couple decades to, to double the trade flows. Because you had to build ports and ships and stuff like that. In trade and services, we're talking about mostly electrons and photons, and that flow has doubled every two years for the last 10 years, and probably will double every two years for the next. So the speed at which this can happen is no longer constrained by the laws of matter, or at least not as much. And as a consequence, if you were judging how fast globalization went in the past, in manufacturing, you're making a mistake about thinking that same pace will apply to services. The second is, what's new about today's AI? In 2019, computers can read, write, see, speak, understand speech, create visual output, recognize subtle patterns. In 2015, they couldn't. So what changed? In my reading, the way I organize my thinking about this is it's the programming. <clears throat> All of you will have known Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow. And psychiatrists call it system one and system two. So basically, humans have two ways of thinking. One is sl slow, effortful, rational, logical. That's what you're doing when you're trying to figure out a 15% tip on the restaurant bill. But we also think fast, which is like if you're reading, you're watching a video while watching, going down the step, you will recognize that there's a cat in the video while you stumble and catch yourself, and your brain has done massively parallel, extremely complex calculations without you thinking about it, without you knowing you're doing it, and in particular, without you knowing how you did it. That's thinking fast. Now, basically, computers, until 2016, we taught them how to think the slow way because we had to program them. And if you write a computer program, you have to lay out every single logical step, what it has to do in every single possible situation, so we could only train it to do things where we think slow. We could not teach it to recognize a cat because we personally don't know how we recognize a cat. From 2016, machine learning allowed us to program computers in an entirely different way. There is no coding. You take a huge amount of data, and then you estimate a statistical model with these algorithms like deep learning or neural networks or whatever. And essentially, it takes up to hundreds of thousands of data points to make a guess about an outcome. And as a consequence, computers have acquired a whole new set of cognitive capacities that they did not have in 2015. They could not see or read. For example, in Switzerland, now they let people come into Switzerland with no human ever checking the passport. You just put it into the machine, and the machine is so good that it knows that Richard Baldwin is Richard Baldwin and lets me into the country. No, no further control. 2015, there was no way that could happen. And what changed was machine learning. Faster than expected. <clears throat> Digital technology is predictable, but unexpected. They even have a name for this. They call it digital disruption. And it happens again and again. This advancement of the digital laws has been going on since Richard Nixon was president. There's nothing new about Moore's Law or any of these things. But business leaders and government leaders and, and academics even get disrupted because they don't expect it. And when looking through this, I was trying to organize my own think of how is it possible that something's predictable but unexpected. And this is what I've come up with. So think about this little diagram where we have progress on the vertical axis and years on the horizontal axis. And I'm going to assert that humans instinctively think about progress in a straight line way. Because our brain, like all animal, human, all animal brains, were evolved to track motion. Everything that moves has a brain. Everything that doesn't move doesn't have a brain. There's even an animal that loses its brain after it fixes a C-squirt uh, and doesn't need it anymore. 
our brains evolved to track motion in a walking distance world. So as a consequence, we naturally, when we think instinctively, we think about increments. We think about the increments last year are going to be more or less like the increments in progress next year because we developed our brains in a walking distance world. So we tend to straight line things. We think about increments. But that's not the way digital technology works. Digital technology follows an exponential curve, which although the, con the growth rate is constant, for years looks like nothing's happening. And that means at some point, the growth is on large increments and it becomes explosive like this. What I'd like to think about this predictable but unexpected is this. First, our gut overestimates the impact. So we landed on the moon and then everybody was talking about colonizing Mars. So we naturally project up and we tend to overestimate the impact of progress and people like me sound alarmist in the short run. When, during the trade, when, the, when the digital technology is doubling every two years, but such a low base, it doesn't make much difference. But at some point, the differences get absolutely large, huge. And I mean, the increments get absolutely explosive. And then our gut underestimates the impact of this. Now, I would just point out that when we think about the future, we don't use our thinking slow calculation models. Like when you think about how likely it is that most taxis will be done self-drive, you're going to use your gut. And your gut evolved to do something very different than track digital technology. So when those two meet, I call it the holy cow moment. And I had a, in the book, I have a number of quotes of CEOs uh, who became former CEOs because they didn't anticipate the holy cow moment. Predictable but unexpected. It's coming in ways that few expect. I hope you like that slide. I actually had to buy that one. You know, the bananas is unexpected. Yeah. Anyways, I'll, I'll, I'll use a different one next time. So I have a few points here. First, think tasks, not occupations. And this isn't unique to me. Many jobs will go, but few occupations will. And I think the analogy is farmers and tractors. Tractors transform the job of farming by replacing some things the farmer did. And it meant we needed fewer farmers to make the same food. But you just shouldn't think about farmers as, it shouldn't think of tractors as baby farmers who just haven't grown up enough. And the same thing's true of digital technology. These white collar robots, those aren't like baby humans that are in the first grade and a few years down the road, they're gonna graduate from high school and do good stuff. Like the tractor, they're gonna do very specific things very well, but not everything. The second is job displacement is the business model. So job displacement is the business model of all the AI geniuses. They wanna get rich, they wanna become billionaires in the next five years, they're designing applications to replace workers. So if you could do the same care with 10% less nurses, you'd become a billionaire. Or if you could drive the taxi with 10% less taxi drivers, you could become a billionaire. The job creation, on the other hand, is driven by human ingenuity and entrepreneurship, which is advancing at its usual casual pace. So the displacement is driven at the explosive pace of digital technology. The creation is driven by human ingenuity. And what we essentially have is in the short run, a mismatch. And to me, the problems and the reason upheaval is the second word in this title is that the displacement may outstrip the creation in the short run, but in the long run, no worries, we'll have the jobs. But it's the transition that we really gotta worry about. So I'm both an optimist and a pessimist when it comes to this, just a question of timeline. Number three, it won't look like Janesville. <clears throat> All sorts of people are talking about the future of globalization as if it was like the last globalization. And the last globalization, you knew when it happened, they shut down a factory, everybody got fired. And we could argue whether it was the robots or China, but it was globotics which caused that, and you knew it happened. That's not the way it's going to happen this time. You're not going to see like an entire building full of insurance guys shut down and all the jobs move off to the Philippines or done by robots. It'll look more like this. I like to call it the iPhone infiltration. How many of you sat at a table like this? I'm so happy none of you are on your phones yet, but that's because I'm talking so fast. Now, if you think about the iPhone about seven, eight years ago, 
It was a mediocre phone with a short battery life, a really good music player, and a web browser that wasn't much good because there was hardly Wi-Fi anywhere. But one cost savings at a time, one increment at a time, these things have invaded our communities, changed the way we deal with our cities and businesses. They have changed the way we interact with our families, the way businesses are structured. But here's the thing. Nobody decided to let that happen. It just happened. And for a long time, we didn't even know it was happening. It looked like a series of twists and turns, not a trend. I think globotics will come into the world of work in this way. White-collar robots will automate one task at a time at a, at a department-level decision. It will be millions or hundreds of millions of people making uncoordinated decisions to replace this chore, that task, with a white-collar robot. And people will be hiring foreign freelancers to do various things, bringing them into the office one at a time. Nobody will be view this as a, a huge thing to talk about. It's just a little bit of cost savings, a little bit of quality improvement to have some guy online every morning who can answer your IT questions from the Philippines. But after five or 10 years, we're gonna look back and say, how did we ever get along with these guys? So I think this globalization, because it doesn't require factories and huge agglomerations, will appear in a very, very different way. Okay, let me, I'm gonna skip over the future of automation because so much has been written about it. There's a bunch in the book, but I'm gonna skip it for the interest of time. So <clears throat> future of globalization. I like to think about arbitrage driving globalization. So when you think about whenever there's relative prices are different of anything between two different countries, there's an incentive for a company to exploit that price difference by producing things where they're cheap and selling where they're expensive. And since it's a relative price difference, there's a two-way buy low, sell high deal to be done. That's the first unbundling trading goods. And it was sparked around 1820 by a radical fall in the cost of moving goods. Globalization led production and consumption to separate and this is what I call the first unbundling in a paper I wrote 13 years ago uh, for the Prime Minister's office. That was what globalization was between 1820 and about 1990, when the ICT revolution came along and started getting useful for globalization. There, ICT allowed the coordination of complex activities across distances, and we started seeing factories crossing borders, not just goods. Now that was, widely observed, offshoring, outsourcing, foreign direct investment, all that, but that missed the revolutionary impact. The revolutionary impact is this gave G7 firms the confidence to take their own manufacturing know-how, which they owned, technical managing and marketing know-how, and combine it with low-wage labor in nearby developing countries. That north to south flow completely transformed the world of manufacturing. For the first time, you could make things with high tech and low wages, whereas before the ICT revolution, you had to choose high wages, high tech, or low wages, low tech, and high wages, high tech always won. So in some sense, it denationalized comparative advantage because the contours of competitiveness were following global value chains, not national borders, or not, at least not only national borders. And it meant that countries like China could in 20 years start exporting goods that they would not have been able to export for 50 or 100 years if they were using their own technology. I'll just point out this is G7 firms taking their technology and moving it to particular countries, which is why it only happened in a few countries. It's, it's a, that's the second unbundling in my last book. The third unbundling is about the physical separation of labor and labor services, or telemigration. With Tele, with the digital technology, people are able to sit in one country and provide services in another country because digital technology is essentially making remote people less remote. Okay, let me go through this, uh, how I think telemigration is happening to try and convince you this is something new. The wage gaps makes telemigration profitable. I don't have to tell anybody in this room that frequently you could hire professional services for one-tenth or one-twentieth of the cost in middle-income countries. And so there's an enormous incentive to arbitrage these differences. The trouble is there were technological barriers to it. And I believe that digital technology is changing that reality at an explosive pace. So Digitech's gonna make it possible, four factors. The first one is domestic telecommuting. 
So many people, uh, especially in the U.S., are starting to work one day or half day a week from home. And our firms and ourselves are rearranging the workflow, the structure, to make remote workers slot into the workflow more easily. They go to projects or matrix. They're adopting collaborative software like Slack and Base and Trello that makes it easier to coordinate a remote team. They're investing in hardware like telepresence rooms or good, good screens and high bandwidth to make it easier to bring in remote workers, most of which are domestic. But once they figured out how to slot remote workers into the workflow, they will soon figure out that they could get at least some of those skills for one-tenth of the price by outsourcing it to foreign freelancers. And in essence, domestic telecommuting is the slippery slope towards telemigration. And if you want to know which jobs are going to be affected by this first, look around your office and see who's telecommuting. Those are the jobs which will most quickly be exposed to foreign wage competition. But of course, when we're in a room like this full of winners, these are expert opportunities for us. So we will all also, if we're very good at what we do, have a bigger audience for our services because we'll be able to provide them remotely. Online freelancing platforms. So these are like the container ships or, or the box. I see we have Mark here, the box of the new globalization. So these are like matchmaking websites like eBay, but for services. So eBay helped you find buyer and seller, find each other, intermeet the, the payment and the shipment and ensure some sort of quality. Things like Upwork, which, which went public last year, it's worth over a billion dollars. They processed a couple billion dollars of freelancing revenue last year. They have millions of freelancers registered in over 100 countries as growing at 20, 30% per year. Uh, these are in essence the way foreign service providers will come into our offices and work. And this is in things like web development, it's absolutely mainstream that a team, an international team, will work virtually together to do a website quickly. A, a programmer from Pakistan, a user experience person from Canada, a, a designer from Uruguay, they're all on the screen working continuously during the day in a virtual office using collaborative software to do that. I just think that's going to go more mainstream. Not everything, but a lot of things. Recently, you won't be surprised, there's a Chinese entrance into this. In China, there's a huge thing called Zubaiji. Probably mispronounced that, but I could use my Google Translate for, for those of you who didn't understand my Mandarin. <clears throat> but they, they launched Whitmart, which is an English language version of this, and that's going to be, be a big, big thing. So you've probably heard of Mechanical Turk and Fiverr and freelancers. There's a big competition going on in this space. Machine translation. I think this is truly underappreciated. Those of us in this room certainly know how difficult language barriers are to almost everything international. And as it turns out, machine translation has gotten very good, very fast. And if you haven't tried it in the last six months, you really have to, because there's been an explosive pace of, of progress. What happened actually was in 2016, the UN put online millions of hand translated sentences among the six major languages, French, English, Spanish, Arabic, Russian, and Chinese. And if you speak one of those languages, the geniuses have estimated a model that translates sentence by sentence, and it's actually very good, both spoken and written. Instantly, it's free right now on your cell phones, your laptops. If you install it on Microsoft, you can write emails in any of the major languages. You write in English, you right click, you put it into French. If you are watching uh, YouTube videos that are foreign language videos, you can get English language caption. So it listens to the Spanish, translates it instantly into English, and puts the captions on the videos. That happens right now. In Skype, there's a Skype translator option where you can speak English, for example. It translates it English instantly into Spanish, and the person on the other end hears Spanish. It's sequential, not simultaneous. But it's, it's amazing, and it's here, and getting better very, very fast. So machine translation is no longer Star Trek. I don't know if I have time for this story. I don't have time for the story. OK, <clears throat> the last one is advanced telecoms. And this is probably the least revolutionary, because I'm sure all of you have realized how much better Skype and FaceTime uh, have gotten, uh, and telepresence, rooms like that. Digital technology is increasing that at an incredible pace. And 5G will change much, uh, a great deal of things, because it'll reduce the latency that makes it hard to talk to people online. 
Okay, the, the result of this will be, in, in my understanding, a global talent tsunami in the service sector. Hundreds of millions of talented, low-cost service providers who were excluded from the world market by the fact that they could not access our markets and excluded because they couldn't speak good enough English. Well, if they have a laptop and internet access, they can go on freelance and sell services. They don't have to speak English anymore because Google Translate is getting so good. The 1990s was a world of a couple billion unskilled laborers joining the world market and transforming the world of manufacturing. I think what we're seeing now is a wave of global talent in the service sector providing a supply side push which will change things dramatically. Or at least I've convinced myself that there's a very good chance of that happening. Future of work, I gotta run here so quickly. Future of work in the long run. First of all, jobs will appear just as they always have before. I have a couple chapters in the book about the previous transformations where we went, what one was called the great transformation where we went from farms to factories and the service transformation where we went from factories to offices. We did find jobs, human creativity is boundless. There'll be all the jobs we need fulfilling needs that we don't even know we need now. But they will appear just as they always have in the past, given enough time. What will these jobs be? We can't know, but here's how I've come to think about it. Globots will do what they can. We will do what Globots can't. So if you want to know what the future of work is, you have to ask, what can't Globots do? And by Globots, I mean remote intelligence and artificial intelligence together. Think about it this way, we don't know the names of those jobs. We don't even know exactly what they'll be providing. But we can think pretty carefully about what we will be doing in those jobs, what the chores will be, what sort of skills we need. And this is not new. When people were leaving the farms in the 1800s, they were going to factories and they didn't actually know what they were going to be making because nobody knew about pharmaceuticals or electrical equipment or cars but they had a pretty good idea of what skills they would need in those factories. And we changed our educational systems to prepare people for factory jobs. Same way, we can think hard about what will be left after artificial intelligence and remote intelligence takes over parts of our jobs. So what can't AI do? So this is the way I've come to think about it. Machine learning is a jet engine, but big data is a jet fuel. So structured data is the key limitation. So the way this machine learning works is if you have an enormous data set where the question is clear, no matter how complex it is, no matter how many variables there are, and the outcome is clear, the geniuses can estimate a model which will get very, very good at guessing on that question and the outcomes. So if what you're doing can be set up in a structured data set, it will soon be replaced, and I mean in a couple years. But many of the things we do in our jobs, the question's never really clear. And often the outcome's not clear. How many of you walked into a, a meeting to you know, organize the week's work and it wasn't clear what the questions were? And it certainly wasn't clear what the outcomes were. You could never gather a structured data set on that process of managing or motivating people. And therefore that process will not be replaced. So the guys at M M McKinsey Global Institute have spun out this idea and they've looked at what current AI can do. And so they've broken it down into seven different workplace capacities and what fraction of the tasks done in US jobs could be automated using current level of technology. And I've ranked them by auto automatability. So the red is what fraction of hours are spent doing these tasks. So predictable physical activities, processing data, collecting data, all of them are, are about even. The red bars are all about the same. And the blue bar shows you what fraction of that time could be automated if they use the AI that exists. And you can see at the top there, you're talking about two thirds of, of the task being automated. And you get down to the bottom, it's quite little. Now, what I would like you to think about is that basically, as you go down that table, the tasks become more human. They require creativity, empathy, motivation, dealing with unknown situations, applying ethics, and those are the jobs that AI can't do, and probably won't for a very long time. So whatever the jobs of the future 
are, we will be doing more human tasks because everything else that's more robotic will be done by AI. And what can RI not do? Remote intelligence. What can't these telemigrants do? Well, the main thing is they can't be in the room. And when you think about your job, your job is a big package of chores, some of which require you to actually be face to face, at least sometime, some of it not. The stuff that's left over for the jobs of the future will require activities where you actually have to be in the same room with somebody to deal with the person or a machine. Because the other stuff will be done by telemigrants. So the future jobs will be more human, more local, will be, more, will be richer because the productivities go up, hopefully will be more generous. So I am very optimistic in the long run if we manage the transition. In my view, there's nothing wrong with the direction of travel. It's the speed. In particular, it's the mismatch of job displacement, which is driven at the explosive pace of digital technology, and job creation, which is driven at the pace of human ingenuity. So we have to worry about the transition. So we could have an upheaval if the white collar workers who are upset about this join with the blue collar workers who got it in the neck the last two decades and have a massive upheaval. That's why the second title word in the title is upheaval. I, I'm seriously worried about it. I'm not predicting it's going to happen, but there is uh, lots of serious people like all the tech geniuses who are worried about an upheaval. So I think we should prepare for it. What can governments do? <clears throat> Plan A is help workers adjust. Let the technology rip and the governments help workers adjust like in Denmark. And there the key is protect workers, not jobs. So let the tech change the jobs and direct whatever we need, but then help people adjust to new jobs. This is nothing new. In fact, digital revolution is just changing jobs. We just might have to do a little faster and we'll be doing it in the service sector, not the manufacturing sector. Plan B is what I call shelterism. So I think workers will want a little shelter from the storm, even if they don't totally oppose the progress. My analogy here is what's happening with Uber in many cities. So this digital technology comes and very disruptive. In cities where the workers have some power, they organize and use existing regulation to slow it down. They, it will force them to, to either have the same regulations or more regulations, and that way they don't stop Uber, but they slow down its implementation and give people time to adjust. And when this happened in the 19th century, we had red flag laws where they had ridiculous requirements for you know, anybody driving a car to have somebody walking 50 meters in front of the car with a red flag to warn all the horses and uh, stuff like that. Longshoremen had feather bedding uh, in, in the, in the tra train industry had the same. I'm quite sure that industry by industry, people will use existing regulations to slow all this stuff down. But if it doesn't work, there is the nuclear option. Use employment protection legislation to slow RI and AI by slowing the firing. So what I want to say with this is although there's severe unintended consequences, it's good to know that governments could slow it down. And you will frequently read, they can't stop it. We can't do anything about it. But that's just not true. Firms are adopting AI and RI to replace workers. And every advanced country in the world has rules about firing workers. If we get massive social revolution, governments could dial up the cost of firing workers very quickly across the entire economy and thereby slow it down because there's no use adopting labor saving technology if you can't fire the labor. So uh, that's, we don't want to go there. It's not a good idea. But when people say we can't control the speed, that's just absolutely not true. Conclusions, globotics coming faster than most think in ways that few expect, it'll create a better world if we manage the transition. The mismatched speed of creation and displacement is the problem. We can control the speed, it's our choice. Now I just wanna say things I didn't have time to talk about. I think AI and RI are gonna have very different implications for inequality, but almost everybody's writing as if it's just gonna be more the same. AI and RI will be viewed by workers as unfair in new ways, and I think that will put the rage in their outrage. And I talk a little bit about individual preparation, although this is not a self-help book. I just talk about a little bit. So I'll end there. Sorry, I went over a little bit. Thank you.
is on. Thank you. Um, thank you, Richard. That was terrific and less depressing than advertised, as well as insightful and stimulating. Um, I apologize for being a moment slow off the mark. I was telling the Twitterverse that the live Q&A were about to start. And I <laughs> Again, the book we're talking about is Richard Baldwin, The Globotics Upheaval. We have a terrific audience in terms of quality as well as quantity, and I will want to turn it over to them since you're going to take on the record questions. You're not an official, you're a sage, so <laughs> do that. But you very much personally set up the book about your intellectual journey. So let me just start things with two questions that come to me, having read the book um, and having heard your presentation. And these reflect me as a macro economist as opposed to a trade economist and a political economy person rather than a sort of straight economist, if you'll forgive the expression. So the first question is, I may have missed it, but you didn't seem to address the issue of productivity. And the way I mean the issue is this is an extreme form of the old solo paradox, right? So you're telling us that jobs are being wiped out at an exponential rate, or at least tasks, excuse me, not occupations, are being wiped out at an exponential rate by machines. And we keep hearing about this, but we've actually seen labor force participation go up in most advanced societies, and we've seen doldrums of investment. And obviously, this links to a whole broader discussion. But it's, it's, there is something jarring about the idea that, that if what's happening, at least in train, is what you're talking about, why are we seeing nothing showing up in terms of labor force or, or productivity numbers? All right. So let me take that in, in two ways. I think most macroeconomists have this image of solo, that GDP equals A times K to the alpha times L to the 1 minus alpha. And what you're saying is A is getting big, capital and employment are OK, so we should see booming GDP. But what we actually see is only a very small number of companies actually doing this so far. Partly because uh, 2016 was the year of AI, according to Forbes and a bunch. This is very new. These new cognitive capacities of, of computers is new, and we're just starting to see it. The second is if you look to see how Google and Facebook and Amazon and Snapchat created billions and billions of dollars of revenue, they did it with almost no workers. So I, I Google, I think, hired 70,000 workers over the last 10 years. And it's worth, I don't know, 100 billion or something like that now. So the companies who are really doing this aren't employing workers, but the rest of the economy hasn't done it. It's a sort of long tail of adoption. So basically, a few companies, which make all the news, are using this. They don't hire many people anyways. And the rest of the firms are, are catching up right now. So that's how I would answer it. I, I'm going to push you a little bit because I've got to admit, as a macro person, I don't find either of those completely compelling. Um, if, if there is, even if it is only a small fraction of companies are using it now, presumably they had to get investment capital from somewhere, from smart investors and VCs and tech people who saw the potential for this. If you are, I mean, you're very smart, Richard, but you can't be the only person who, who's looking ahead of the holy cow moment. And we know historically, including with the last internet revolution, generally when there is technological progress, you get overinvestment up front because you, you sort of know the technology is coming, but you don't know which specific firm is going to win. So I got to admit, that, that right. why isn't there an investment response, even if it's not yet large enough to move the needle on GDP? Right. So two, two responses. One, there is an investment response. And let me just go to people who know more tech than I. <coughs> If you get the quotes from Bill Gates or Elon Musk or um, the, the guy who runs eBay, they're the most alarmist that saying things are changing. They're, they're the ones that are apocalyptic, and they actually know what's going on. And the AI scientists are even more so, like uh, Andrew Ning. Uh, he, he's talking about projects replacing lots of people that haven't come through yet. And there is a huge amount of, of trying to use these pieces of AI, the new capacities, to create the killer app. The second thing is what's, what I call in the book variance law. And the innovation in the digital world is very, very different 
because the digital components are free. Actually, it's an amazing world. It's open source software, APIs, free databases. You can even use incredibly powerful computers online for free or for very little. So what you have is many, many people trying to combine free digital components into very expensive or very valuable products, and it's coming at an exponential pace. Varian called it the combinatorial innovation. So I think a lot of this is going on, but unlike a car where you need a laboratory, you need, you, know, you need all sorts of bits and pieces, it's expensive, you have to invest, it takes years, but we have people trying to throw together the next Snapchat or Uber, which involved no breakthrough technologies at all, frequently were created at least in the beginning in somebody's basement, so to speak. And so I think the whole innovation process is very, very different. But it, I think the, the primary response is that this stuff really started happening in 2016 and 2017 and 2018, so we haven't seen it come through the pipeline um, in, a, in a macro way. That leads into the political economy points, though, Richard. Um, so there are some people who would argue that the network big uh, tail for not long tail, the, uh, the happy tail firms, um, are there not because necessarily innovation or just innovation or technology, but because they, are, uh, they have pseudo-natural monopolies, they are patent trolls. You say about all the open access, but a lot of these companies you name spend a lot of money and a lot of time trying to own and enforce patents. You know, maybe this is partly just a standard monopoly oligopoly story. And how do we observationally distinguish that? So, uh, I mean, there, there's no doubt that that's all going on. But, but just, for example, with machine translation, the big breakthroughs were published in open source journals and spread rapidly among all the big guys. And the databases they're using are all online. So there's a, it's a different, uh, different I idea there. But what, the things that are really going to move the dial in terms of job displacement are the things that don't make the headlines, robotic process automation. So if you've never seen this, look up Blue Prism or AI Path or automation anywhere. There's a whole bunch of firms around there helping people replace workers in these database jobs. And they don't make the headlines because they're so unsexy. And I showed you a picture of one. Can you imagine writing an article and that would be the picture on the headline? Nobody would read it. But that's what they are. They're software. So I think those things are coming in uh, through, uh, they, they, they have a very rapid growth rate, but they're starting, basically we're starting in 2016 because that's when computers could read like emails and answer telephone calls and take down what actually was said. So that's all just starting to go through. And the high-end stuff is also being applied very widely. IBM Watson is being applied in all sorts of different things. And IBM has bet the future of their career on this sort of high-end automation. So I, I do think it's happening. We just haven't seen enough time for it to come through. Okay, a final question for me, and I'm glad you're spelling this out. I knew you'd have ready responses. Um, is also from the political economy sphere, but, but going back to some of your trade work. Protectionism is alive and well. Protectionism in the broadest sense is, if anything, stronger now than it's been in some time. You mentioned about these people of skill and intelligence and now translatable who are in service industries around the world. The American medical profession, the American legal profession, and other self-declared professions <clears throat> have successfully managed to protect their guilds for decades when lower income people were subject to competition. And they've done this not through technological barriers, but through political, reputational, and um, regulatory barriers. Why is the globotics upheaval going to work on the rich people of privilege in a way that trade up till now has not. Right, so let, let me answer that in a very general way first. So the real big change, when people talk about AI, what AI is an old, old story and it's many, many different things, but what you gotta pay attention to is machine learning. Now machine learning is essentially experience-based pattern recognition, which is what most high-end professionals make their living on. 20 years of knowledge in law. And machine learning can do that. Just for example, in law, there's been quite a systematic replacement of paralegals and young lawyers because of these AI things that can read. So for example, there's a, one that's called Revell, where uh, it's, it, it's used mostly in patent, uh, patent protection things. 
where this computer reads all the rulings of the judge on the issue that you're ruling in front of and notes what he looked at, what principle he seems to refer to, and thereby gets rid of a very large range of low workers. And law firms are getting a flatter structure because they're taking out the, the junior lawyers. The, the most senior partners are making more money, but the junior lawyers are either doing very routine work where they're essentially creating structured databases by tagging things, or they don't have uh, jobs. So that's already happening in the legal profession, just to take one. But more specifically, what I was talking about shelterism is I really do think that organized groups will use existing regulation to slow this down. And in particular, well, they'll try health safety environment for anything slightly physical, but they'll use privacy regulations to slow down the rest of it. And I'll give you an example. In Switzerland, we have extreme bank secrecy laws, which means people will go to jail if client data leaves the country. And if it's accidental, there's hundreds of thousands of dollars of fine for each one. And as a result, there is no offshoring of back office activities in Switzerland. So they've used regulation to prevent offshoring of service sectors. And that, I'm quite sure, will go forward. But the trouble is there's lots and lots of things that aren't regulated in that way, and we won't have time to create regulation for the people who are working in the accounts department and all those sorts of things. So, and also in the lawyers or, or the doctors or the engineers or the architects, part of them will benefit from this and others will lose from it. So it's not absolutely sure, for example, that the architects guild will want to block all use of AI in designing buildings. Well, just to give a very concrete example, um, right now architects that are really good can visualize the building and they can walk around in it. But with virtual reality, you write down something in a computer model and you can walk around in that building virtually. So you do not have to be a highly talented, highly experienced architect to design buildings as, as much. Now that will actually make some architects much more productive. So I don't think they're gonna try and ban that kind of technology. But in some things like Uber or medical records or financial records, there definitely will be an effort to block the regulation. And then let me just round that out in terms of regulation. We have all the governance we need for this. It's called the General Agreement on Trade and Services. And to be boring, what I'm talking about is mode one services. And most of us have made open commitments in mode one services in many of these business services already. And we've committed most to Most of not us being member governments, not yes, individuals. That's right, the member governments. And, and, so, and also committed to not taxing digital flows. So a lot of the most obvious blocks are gone, and we do not need an international agreement to, to make this work. So it's going to happen. It's going to be very hard to resist. At least there's a good chance that it'll be hard to resist. We are talking about the future. I guess the place where I am more pessimistic on politics, although I guess more optimistic for labor than you, is... I don't underestimate the speed to which affected interest groups can mobilize regulatory <laughs> protection. But we'll see about that. Um, let me open it up to the floor. As usual, we have Jessica with a standing mic, a wandering mic up front. There's a standing mic up back. Please feel free to queue up at the mic. When you're recognized, please state your name and affiliation. And please make it a question, no matter how brilliant your insight is. Please. <laughs> Thanks very much, Richard, for a fascinating presentation. Uh, Will Martin from IFPRI. Um, my, my question, um, what's the fundamental factor intensity we're talking about? I mean, in your last book, it was the opening up, the widening of the market for skills of people who could work in factories that really mattered. Um, is it raw talent, the sort of raw talent that much of which in the developing world is stuck, you know, up country without access to education? Or is it acquired skills? If it's acquired skills, presumably that's beneficial to the rich countries currently. If it's raw talent, I'm not sure what the answer is. Right. Your answer. Thank you very much for that question. Um, and, and it speaks to the inequality thing. So just to sort of run through a couple centuries of history extremely fast, the technological breakthrough that led to the first globalization and automation was essentially steam power, then mechanization. And that made people who work with their hands radically more productive People who work with their heads only tangentially were affected by it. So fundamentally, once from 1870, that was equalizing because the people who work with their hands who had lower incomes 
saw the rising productivity, people who work with their heads who were ahead didn't see it as much. The second wave, the computerization that started from 1970, that created better substitutes for people who work with their hands and better tools for people who work with their heads. There was a skill twist that led to a rising inequality from about 1970. Now this is not more of the same. This machine learning is creating substitutes for some type of thinking. And we don't know exactly where it's going, but it's data-based pattern recognition. And when you think about your own service jobs, some of the most difficult, most valuable things you do are experience-based pattern recognition and good judgment. And that's what this is creating substitutes for. So in the book, just to be, uh, you know, it's a very popular book. I said, this will add more head to people who have a lot of heart. Because AI can't do the hard thing. But it can make average people way smarter. It could make a nurse much better at diagnosing diseases. It helps the doctor a little bit, but it helps the nurse a lot. And since head and heart are sort of orthogonally distributed, I don't see any reason why artificial intelligence should continue the skill twist. And in particular, I think it will raise the level of average thinkers by giving them more powerful tools. And one of the amazing things about AI is how easy it is to use. Uh, so I, that, that's why I think it's really creating substitutes for people at the sort of high middle income skills, but then also lots of things which required people to read or write or speak or engage in dialogue. So it's, it's more diverse, so I don't see it as being disruptive. So how to prepare for it? Well, you need to do more human skills, things that require you actually to be in the room and deal with actual people or in the room with some sorts of machines that can't be done remotely. So that's, I think those skills, those more human skills, will be more valued. In case my introduction earlier didn't persuade you of Richard's academic half, the line, head and heart are orthogonally distributed, <laughs> should remind you that we're starting from a basis in economics here. Please. Uh, Brad Setzer, Council on Foreign Relations. Um, I was wondering if you could uh, say a few words about the impact or potential impact of globotics on tax. Right. I have a vision of computers owned by vehicles in the Cayman Islands running software and algorithms based in Bermuda, sweeping out uh, what are currently taxable profits. Right, excellent. Thank you very much. So I think it's going to be mostly an issue on the telemigration side, not the automation side. So the automation, these are basically software. Somebody owns the software. It's like Excel spreadsheets. And you don't tax Excel spreadsheets, but the people who use it in, in principle, they could pay a sales tax or whatever on it. But where it's really tricky is telemigration. So for example, you mentioned Vox. I hired through Upwork a copy editor who sits in Bangkok, who, who has a master's degree from Columbia, speaks perfect English, but is uh, doing copy editing online for what I think is a very con uh, reasonable price. And I know she doesn't pay tax in London. You're not supposed to say this okay. out loud. Out loud, okay. <laughs> it's in the book. It's actually in the book. Oh, good. Right. And, and uh, she probably doesn't pay in Bangkok. So I think that part of the unfair is that workers who are competing with these guys said they're not paying taxes. Now, last week or t 10 days ago, I was in Davos, and I met the CEO of Upwork, Stephen Kesserel. And he said, I asked him about this tax thing, and he says, well, in the United States, we provide 1099s for all the freelancers. And it's just the governments don't ask us. So the Sri Lanka, a lot of people work in Sri Lanka on Upwork in the tech sector, but the Sri Lankan government doesn't ask Upwork for their 1099s. They just have to ask. Well, we'll see how, how that starts going, if that picks up. But the taxation of, of remote uh, teleworkers, I think, is a much bigger issue uh, and, and really, it's, it's an issue for Sri Lanka and the Philippines, not really so much the U.S., although a little bit. But if, say, 10% of the workforce in Sri Lanka goes online and stops paying taxes to the local economy, that could be an issue. So that's where I would go with the tax. Okay. Our final question, please. So hello. Thank you for the presentation. I'm Claudia Biancotti, a visiting fellow here. And um, my question is on uh, telemigration and inequality. Uh, so if a service provider from uh, Pakistan can uh, seamlessly sell his uh, services uh, anywhere in the world, uh, they'll probably choose the rich countries because uh, <coughs> it's going to be more rewarding financially. Uh, so uh, isn't there a risk uh, of a massive brain drain facilitated by technology whereby service providers of quality in developing countries all work for rich countries uh, and human capital is locally depleted? 
And in case you see this risk, uh, what sort of uh, policy measures uh, would you expect uh, the governments uh, of developing countries to put into place uh, to, to avoid this? Thank yeah. you. So that's not a future issue. That is happened already in the IT. So w people who have skills in developing countries like to work on these freelancers because they get paid reliably and they get paid what seems like very good money when you're, when you're paying Sri Lankan things. So it's already happened, this disconnection between skilled workers and online freelancing in, in some developing countries. It's an issue for them, but it's also, I mean, as long as they get, make sure that the money comes back into the country eventually, it's like an export opportunity. And in, in this book, I don't talk at all about the development consequences, but I've been asked that question a number of times. And I think it basically means that lots of countries will have a development experience that looks a lot more like India's than China's, where export of services is a massive part of this export-led growth where people start getting reliable incomes, they start buying things, and the growth mechanism starts going through services. But I think developing countries will have to react, and they probably should set up their own platforms, both to provide accreditation, so we know what a, a, a bookkeeping certificate is in the Philippines, what does that mean, and also to control the taxation and to promote it. So I think the response would be for the developing countries to set up their own platforms, or at least cooperate with the existing platforms. Great. I'm afraid we're going to have to end it there. Thanks to all of you for listening, except the tax authorities. Um, <laughs> thanks to Richard and to Richard's publisher, Oxford Press, which has given us the Globotics upheaval. You can get the first chapter free on Google Books. You can find your way to purchasing this via the PIE website, as well as distribute this marvelous presentation by Richard. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was great. Now I have